heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. But there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Zola Levitt presents. Considering the times and seasons of our world today, here's Zola Levitt. Shalom. Hello again. Well, if you tuned in last week, <laughs> your head's probably still swimming because uh, Professor Gerald Schroeder held forth with his fascinating theories of cosmology and the Bible. He's the author of the book Genesis and the Big Bang, which is a sensational book. I have read it, and The Science of God, and I've read it too. And as I said last week, you know, when I uh, have guests on the show, I take a look at their books, but these books I read all the way through. They're, they're fine, wonderful. And uh, fascinating theory, which um, he is uh, uh, going to explain with charts and so on. He's uh, got his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate from MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was a professor there for seven years. He moved to Jerusalem 20-some uh, years ago and uh, has been working there ever since on his uh, nuclear physics and of course, on Scripture. Uh, Gerald, thanks for joining us again. Glad to be in Dallas with you. Now, let's review again uh, your theory that the six days of Genesis and the 15 billion years of the history that some say we see on Earth are the same thing. Yeah. Well, I'd like to take credit for the theory, but I have my feeling it's really physics that has taught, taught us this to the world. Mm -hmm. That essentially, the difference, the two main factors are the six days of Genesis that start with the creation of the universe and end with Adam are seen in the, from the biblical perspective looking from the creation forward. Remember the Bible taught us that by saying there was evening and there was morning, day one. Day one being from the beginning. We look back in time and see billions of years. The Bible looks forward in time, see six days. Uh -huh. But the difference in this perspective, Zola, is that we're looking back from a large universe if this would be a model of the universe, the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, uh -huh. the first 31 sentences of Genesis, look forward from the beginning, from the fact that the Bible is telling us there was evening and morning, day 1, 1, the beginning of time, not a first day, day 1. So we look forward, the universe expands out, and just as the universe expands out in dimension and gets larger and larger, the stretching of space does more than just stretch, stretch space, as we noticed. It stretches any information that is traveling in the space. So information that is put forward here as seconds would be seen possibly as millions of years. Alternatively, when we, if you were looking at events that take place today with our huge universe and sending them back in time, back, back, back in time to a perspective when the universe was tiny, that shrinking, that mental trip backward of shrinking the space smaller does exactly the same thing to the passage of, of time. And that was the quote I mentioned last week from a, a textbook of a supreme authority, The Principles of Physical Cosmology, Princeton University Press. I mean, you can't get an, a print imprint better than that okay. as far as physics goes, yeah. that the exact same relationship between the stretching of space or going back the shrinking of space relates also to the rate at which you have observed times. So a minute at the beginning of time, we learned, would be a million squared, a million million minutes. Six days from the beginning of time would be six million million days. And I think, it wasn't last week, you asked the people on the back of their calculator to just... Yeah, learn. I can tell you how to calculate this. It, it, it boils down to simple arithmetic. Just take a calculator, put on there 15 billion years, which is the... Uh, uh, the history of the world as seen with fossils and, and geology and so on. Put 15 billion. Divide that by the factor of which time has dilated, a million squared. That is a one followed by 12 zeros. You may have to cancel some zeros to get this on your calculator. But anyway, you're dividing uh, 15 billion by uh, one million squared. You will get 0.015 of a year, 15% uh, of a year. Uh, or well, one, one and a half, half percent, percent of a year. And you multiply that times 365 days, you'll find that's about six days. Yeah, it's amazing. I always say it's a quite a good guess for a book for 3,000 years old. You know, it's, I mean, <laughs> but I guess it wasn't the guess. I just love it. I, I think it's wonderful. I, I, I've 
you know, the six days and the, and the fossil history and everything that goes into them. Then, then it looks like, like I said in one of my books, the Bible has seemed to learn a lot lately. You know, <laughs> it's like... Uh, well, as prophecy right. happens, that yeah. was my point in that. Was, sure. well, the Bible seemed to learn that the Jews are going to come back to Israel. The Bible has seemed to learn they're going to have trouble. Mm -hmm. and, and, and by gosh, it, now it seems to learn that uh, there was room enough in those six days for all that um, uh, creation to happen. It sounds like the Bible is getting smarter all the time. Well, maybe it's, maybe it's, we're finally starting to understand the Bible. That might be closer. Huh? So the key is looking forward in time from the, from the perspective of the book of Genesis or looking back in time from 1990. And we only have our perspective. We have to look back in time. And that, of course, is the entire key to the whole phenomena. The Bible is looking forward in time. We look back in time. Uh -huh. so, oh, they, so we have Bible looking forward, the arrow going that way, and science looking backward, backward from where and we so are. And so what okay. we have on this chart now is the six days of Genesis ending at a time when Adam, first of the humans, okay. gets the soul of human life. The Hebrew word is neshama, the soul of human life. And the blue line here, this double line that's written right here, indicates the end of a calendar, of a biblical calendar, and the beginning of an earth-based calendar, a calendar in the Bible from Adam forward that sees years as we see years now. The moment the soul of human life, the neshama, is implanted on the earth, the Bible abandons its view of looking forward and adopts a human view because now humans are in, jun in junction with God to perfect the world. I mean, Adam walks, knows God. Okay. So the toe become, becomes similar. One thing I have to emphasize over and over, these biblical days are not eras. They are 24 hours each, ditto, 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 all the way down. The idea that people say, well, the days are eras is a 20th century phenomena trying to apologize for misunderstanding. There is no ancient commentary that says anything other than Every ancient commentary says the following. The days of Genesis are 24 hours each by a clock, as we said last week, but they contain all the ages of the universe. And Albert Einstein taught us the reality of these two differing views of the universe. Phenomenal insight. And once we get, once we get into that flow, then the question is, what's the duration of each day? Mm -hmm. See, when we look back, that million million refers to taking this whole together. But we don't have to be settled for an average, because now, and what's so great Zola being here today, only in about the last 10 years can we now know the universe so well that we can calculate the duration of each day. Mm -hmm. The Bible looks forward from the beginning, but immediately the universe is expanding. So the perspective is changing day by day as the universe gets larger yes. day by day. So each day will have a different duration. And what counts is, as we read, I won't go into the quote that we talked last week, but the idea of looking forward versus backward, this rate of change, that the rate of change, every time the universe doubles in size, the time relationship halves. So if you double, 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 it's going half, half, half a quarter and eighth is 16. But when you think about what this means, when the universe is small, it's doubling in size very rapidly because it only has to move out a small amount. That's right, yeah. By the time the universe is big, I mean, if it takes an hour to go from here, yeah. now it's twice as big, it's going to take two hours, yeah. four hours, yeah. eight hours, two, four, eight, 16. Anyone that has any knowledge of mathematics will know that that's exponential. Mm -hmm. and so beautiful. It's just so exquisite. The exponential relationship is the most common relationship that exists in the universe. Uh -huh. We find it in the shape of the Nautilus seashell, uh -huh. one that I have from Cape Town, uh -huh. current. An ammonite, 270 million years ago, somewhere on day five, the seeds on a sunflower the stars in a galaxy. <laughs> All do the same curve. From, yeah. from galaxies to sunflowers, Zola, uh -huh. the most common relationship in the universe is the exponential spin. And what we're seeing here, what it means by exponential is that each swirl is a given factor, like twice as big or three times. It depends what the factor is, but a given factor bigger than, if you're going out, than the previous swirl, or smaller than if you're going in. And when we apply this, to the universe. 
in linear time, and as we unroll that spiral, uh -huh. and look how it, how it would look. So we would see a curve going like that, where most of the change would be taking place in the original days, and as you get closer and closer to the higher number of days, four, five, six, the amount of change is slower, mm -hmm. because the universe is bigger. Yeah. It takes more time to double, and these are the numbers. Zola, when I first did this calculation, you know, we talk about it now, but when I was struggling with it, and after two years of trying to understand this, the numbers came out, I ran to my wife, I said, Barbara, and like I was covered with glass, I said, Barbara, you can't believe it. The numbers are phenomenal. And she said, eat your supper. Eat your supper. No, she, she was excited. I was like, yeah, no, I just thought. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> and this is what it comes out, each day, 24 hours each from a perspective looking forward. But we don't have that option. We're not God. Yeah. We look back in time. The first day comes out to be 8 billion years. The second day, 4 billion, 2, 1, a half a quarter, right? Because the, the rate of change is, more, is slower, so we expect each day to have less and less time. And then this calendar is abandoned, and a new calendar began. If we maintained this calendar, we would see that we were today in the late, late, late afternoon of the sixth day. Interesting. The Sabbath is about to occur. I'm not saying we can predict it. I'm not going to get into that discussion, but it is interesting. That is fascinating. It certainly is. Okay, and you have actually gone on. We're going to take a break in a moment, but your chart uh, not only has the timings, but then you have what the Bible says happened on each day and what science also says happened on each day. So when we come back, um, if you're following, <laughs> Gerald Schroeder will explain his chart further after this. Come with Zola Levitt and see for yourself the land of the covenant. You know, Zola has, puts on one of the most spectacular trips you could ever be on. You just The whole group, everybody just puts everything together. It's spectacular. With what was chosen for us to do, as well as who guided us, who spoke with us, the other people on the trip, it was wonderful. Uh, other people said they went on cruises or, and trips like this, and it was all historical, and they saw a lot of size, but this was spiritual, and this was really good. So I'm really glad I picked Zola Levitt's uh, group to tour the Holy Land. Tour the Holy Land with Zola Levitt. Call or write for more information. Well, that's Israel. We'll show it to you if you'll come with us and, and probably show you Gerald, too. He, he's going to try to uh, speak to our tour group. And, uh, boy, I think you're going to... I'm going to set them asking questions anyway. But this is fascinating, Gerald. Now, you showed us that uh, uh, the 24-hour uh, days actually, the first one was 8 billion years, the second was 4 billion, and so on. Now, let's go back to your chart. We can learn when each day started, right? Yeah. Once we know how long each day lasted, we can start adding back to see when the days began. And that's really powerful because now we'll be able to see what the Bible said happened in this particular time, namely day 1, 2, 3, 4 and what science says, because now we have the correlation. So if day six lasted a quarter of a billion years, that means it started about a quarter of a billion years ago, if we neglect the 6,000 years, it's a small difference. Mm -hmm. If day five lasted a half a billion years, so then we'd have to add this and this, and we'd find that day five began three quarters of a billion. One and three quarter, three and three quarter, seven and three quarter, and finally day one would have begun about 15 and three quarter billion years ago. Okay. You know, that just happens to be the guess coming that out of squares with cosmology. Yeah, isn't it amazing? <laughs> the, the Bible gets smarter and smarter. It's just amazing. Okay. <clears throat> so now that we know the periods of the days, the beginning of the day and the end of the day, down each to each day, we can see how science squares up with the Bible. The Bible's fixed. It can't change. Mm -hmm. We'll just see what science has to say. So by the Torah, the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 says, in the beginning. Well, that had the scientists rolling in the aisles for about 2,000 years. The Aristotle and Plato said, beginning, come on, there's no beginning, the universe is eternal. And through 1959, a survey showed, published in Scientific American, two-thirds of the scientists surveyed when asked the age of the universe, said, beginning, the universe is eternal. Not any longer, mm -hmm. Zola. The Big Bang 
is essentially accepted. We had a beginning. The universe had a beginning. Science has come to confirm the first word of the Bible. There was a creation. Score one for the Bible. Okay. A few other things. That we'll go through the key events, but moving straight, just straight ahead. So we have a beginning. We have actually light separating from darkness. It says here that God says, let there be light. Light so it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Why you'd have to have light dividing from darkness? you know, confuse people forever. It doesn't make sense. You have light, you have darkness. Mm -hmm. No, it makes a lot of sense. Because when the universe was young, just in this period, right shortly after the beginning, it was so hot that in fact light and dark were actually mixed together in what's called a plasma. When information is just all squeezed together. And as the universe expanded, and the heat that was held in here became more and more dilute because the universe was getting bigger, so it was getting cooler. Mm -hmm. The same amount of heat in this volume keeps a lower temperature if it's this volume. Mm -hmm. Finally, the plasma cooled, and what happens in technical terms is electrons bound around protons, atoms formed in other words, mm -hmm. and light broke free. Literally, light separated from darkness. So there are two key statements that are mentioned, the key events of day one, are matched exactly in this time frame by science. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's phenomenal. Okay. We just take it for granted, but it's just mind-boggling. <laughs> so day two says, let there be a firmament, and let's divide the waters from the waters, and the rakia shemayim, the firmament of the heavens. Well, when we look up in the sky, the firmament of heavens, that's the globe of stars. You see in these wonderfully black desert nights. Come to the Negev sometime, or outside of Jerusalem. You, you just, no, no wonder Moses found it. It's yeah. magnificent. Yeah. And these, the, we see this, this canopy of stars. All those stars are in the disk of the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says this Rakia Shemayim, this firmament of heavens, forms somewhere in here between seven and three quarter billion years ago and the end of that day. And by golly, the age of the disk of the Milky Way. It's a hard number to pin down, but the number that appears most often, mm -hmm. well, what would you guess? I'll give you a hint, it's on the board. Seven and three quarters of a million years ago, billion, billion years ago, the disk of the Milky Way formed. I see, so there are the heavens, the firmament was the firmament. made. Mm -hmm. Our, the, the, uh, the sun actually forms here, the, it becomes visible here. Our sun is 4.6 billion years old, forms, it's a main sequence star, bingo, right in the middle of day two. Uh -huh. Point after point, the Milky Way, the sun, one after the other matches. Day number three really goes out on a limb. Day number three, the Bible says, let there be war, the, the oceans form, uh, let the waters in the heaven be gathered into one place of the dry land. It's, it's Genesis chapter 1, verse 9. So we have the oceans and the world. We have, we have dry land and water. It's the first time we're told by the ancient commentaries that the Hebrew word mayim, which appears waters, means now water, liquid water on the earth. Uh -huh. okay? okay? My doctor at MIT is in two fields, oceanography and nuclear physics. Oh, wow. And it's a two-field doctor. It's only one doctor. It's two fields. And... So when I got this number, I mean, the age of water on the earth happened to know like I know my address, yeah. which I sometimes forget. And uh, <laughs> three point three quarter, three and three quarter billion years ago is an exact match. Check one for the Bible. Yeah. And the first life, this is mind boggling for science, science and biology, because it had always been assumed that water forms on the earth and then billions of years would go by to life would form somewhere down here, billions and billions of years later. In fact, Nobel Prize winners waxed poetic. I mean, it's just, go you just read some of these statements that go back maybe 25, 30 years, how billions of years of random reactions to form life and the soup that Darwin always talked about. Not any longer. No. Liquid water forms on Earth and life forms on Earth, and they both form the day three period. Life, the fossils of life, the oldest fossils of life, not large fossils like these, but algae, bacteria, the first earliest plant life goes back to, three, to between 3.6 and 3.8 billion years. In exact match what the Bible says on day three, let the waters appear and let the earth bring forth plant life. Mm -hmm. It's an exact, it's just extraordinary. Oh, yes. We move on, that's day three. Mm -hmm. Day four, it says that the God makes the word create. By the way, on day three, the word creation doesn't appear. It's quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. you, know, you think, well, when does God create life? It's the wrong phraseology. The Bible is very careful when it uses the word create. The Bible says there's a creation back here. 
and that brings into the universe time, space, and matter, and the laws of nature. And every, every colleague I have, secular, religious, doesn't matter what, sees these laws of nature as if we are written into the universe in the beginning, and hence, when life appears on day three, it just says, God said, let the earth bring forth life. The earth is tuned for life, not human life, not animal life, but plant life you don't need a special creation for, or the word creation would appear on day three. It's a hard thing to, to internalize, but we don't have to claim, we should give God credit for, for the credit that God has of design. It's a design of universe, and that's what yeah. we got here. So it, it generates life. Yeah, life, as far as the first forms, the more primitive forms of life, they are built into the system from the beginning. It's a phenomenal thing that the word creation does not appear on day three when life appears. The earth brings forth life. And you know, we're gonna, I, I'm sure we will find eventually, we'll, we'll, dis we'll discover things called catalysts, which speed reactions, which allowed life to start immediately. We'll say, mm, what well, luck, those catalysts were there all along, you know? Oh. And we'll, but we'll never say, gee, how did those catalysts get there? You know, and there is who put the catalysts there? Who put these forces present to force life to come into being? Okay. And nonetheless, water and life start immediately. It's a mind-boggling revolution in biology because go back 20 years ago, read the literature, billions of years passed between water and life. No, no, not even hundreds of millions of years. The fossils of life coincide almost the same time with the origin of, of water on the earth. Mm -hmm. Now we go further, we come to day four, and we're told that God makes the sun. The word creation does not appear on day four. God makes the sun and the moons. Now, the difficulty in ancient, in ancient Hebrew commentary, at least, the Talmud example, and the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah it's not clear because there are different p opinions. The, the Talmud says the sun appears back here but becomes visible here. Now, if I was reading this, this, te this is what, your, your Bible here is which translation? So this is, is the King James, the Schofield Bible. It's, so it's a, it's a new translation, and it says the, uh, this. On day know, four? On day four, there's a subtitle that, I was reading it just before we went on, on, on. This is the. There's the first uh, four, and God saw well, the that's light. the first day. Let's get over here to day four. And day four, it says here that the, uh, Day four, the sun and the moon bec and stars become visible. Uh huh. Become visible. Okay. This because this is taking into some modern understanding. So oh yes, it becomes visible. Because even right. though the text actually say God makes them, because what happens here is the the atmosphere changed from being translucent back here, the earth was still warm. Yeah. To transparent here, and that's exactly what happened. As the atmosphere clarifies, yeah. oxygen goes up. Then you can see the heavenly yeah, bodies. Exactly. Oh, and that's why, and then the verse goes on that, that uh, 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 and let them be for signs and for seasons. Well, that you couldn't have used them for signs and for seasons during, in the translucent because it would always just look smudgy. But now that you could see the sun rise and fall, so so called, in the moon, you could use them that yeah, way. It's extraordinary. It's just just very beautiful. accurate. Okay, oh, it's beautiful. The day, Bible is getting smarter. Every yeah, day. yeah. Or maybe we're getting smarter. <laughs> yeah. Day number five. Then day number five, the Bible goes on a, out on a great limb, as if the author was sure of of knowing the truth. So in day number five, which starts on about. Uh, verse 20, it says, let the waters swarm abundantly with teams of moving creatures. So the Bible says three things about the first, this is the first mention of animal life, mm -hmm. okay, and there's a creation, this, the nephesh, the soul of animal life. The Bible in verse 20 says, let the waters, aquatic life, swarm, and it's an explosion of life, with teams of animal life. It's the first animal, so on day five, the Bible claims at least three things happen. First animal life, it's in the waters, uh -huh. And it's an explosion of yeah, life. Yeah. You're so, sure quoting very accurately, okay. Yeah. <laughs> the Scientific American, November 1992. The Big Bang of Animal Evolution. Uh -huh. The Big Bang of Animal Evolution. About 600 million years ago. Oh, dear. Right in day five. 600 million. 600, well, three quarters is 750 million years. Down to 200. So 600 million years falls right here. Mm -hmm. An explosion of life brought into being the basic, but an explosion of life, simultaneously brought into being the basic body plans of all modern multicellular animals. Hear this thing? An explosion of life, about 600 million years ago, explosion of life, brought into the, simultaneously every body plan that exists today. That wasn't the way I learned it in school, and that's scientific American. I learned it in school very differently, that things gradually changed, slowly. 
but instead the Bible tells us that it's aquatic. Every one of those body plans was in the waters. It was an explosion of life, and it was sudden, and it happens exactly here. So it matches exactly. Between day five and day six, about 250 million years ago, a quarter of a billion years ago, there's a decimation. 90% of all animal life disappears in the fossil record, and land animals repopulate the land. The Bible on day six says land animals come, yeah. then comes mammals, and then comes humans. The fossil record says exactly the same thing. First comes land animals, mammals, and humans. Point in, these, in a few minutes, we're able to squeeze together in 31 sentences. Remember, there's only 31 <laughs> from here. To, we have 50,000 books at MIT descri describing these things. The Bible in 31 sentences brings it together. And it really, you know, the, the, the fun part of it is it doesn't miss. I mean, it doesn't put men on the fifth day or fish on the sixth day or, or anything out of its proper order as given here in Scripture. It's extraordinary. Gerald, I don't know what the people will think, and it's science, and it's difficult to follow in some ways, but uh, I think you've made a, a magnificent discovery here. Well, <laughs> I, you know, as a scientist, it just seemed, I, I was excited by finding it, but it certainly seemed to be logical. Obviously, in the science of God, I go point by point, and I really tried to lead the reader by the hand, because I think it's an important message. Science and the Bible have been fighting for too many years, yeah. and it's destructive to science, it's destructive to Bible, and it's destructive to society, and there's no need for it. Let me plug that. It's his book, The Science of God, and uh, his other book, Genesis and the Big Bang. I, I've read them both. They're, they're just wonderful books, and uh, spiritual books, I'll say. Uh, very, very illuminating. Uh, go ahead and send us a letter. If you object, we'll pass it on to Gerald, and uh, no, it's it's a fine thing, I think, a wonderful piece of work. Uh, our offer is simply our, our own newsletter, the Levitt Letter, and our catalog of items that we have offered on past programs. We, we really haven't prepared uh, materials on cosmology or science or Genesis uh, in this sense, so uh, we're um, uh, going to offer our newsletter and our catalog. If you'll send in your name and address, those things are free. You don't have to send any money. Uh, well, as I say that, I will say that it will help us if you do send a gift, and that would be fine. I'm not specifying what gift, but uh, as we uh, make programs like this and go to expense and so on, I think you know there's, there's really no free television. So if you could help, I would appreciate it. Funds is the way that we survive. And remember these books, The Science of God in particular is a, a new book and available in, in any bookstore. And uh, Gerald Schroeder, thank you so much for, for uh, coming to see us. It was completely my pleasure, Zora. Thank you so much for having me. Shalom, shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem.